Dobro večer još jednom. Moje ime je Đorđe Đorđević, ja sam menadžer za inovacije u ICT Hubu. Dobrodošli u ICT Hub, dobrodošli u naš prostor Playground. Veliko mi je zadovoljstvo da vam poželim toplu dobrodošlicu na večerašnji događaj. Drago mi je da ste došli u ovolikom broju. Drago mi je da ima ovoliko ljudi koji se interesuju za Internet of Things. Danas smo spremili zaista lep događaj. Imamo jednog od pionira Internet of Things-a u celom svetu i predstavit ćemo, odnosno danas ćemo zvanično lasirati naš projekat na kojem radimo već izvesno vreme sa našim partnerima iz VIP Mobile, a to je VIP IoT Challenge Digitalizuj društvo. Da ne dužim previše, pozvao bih Natali Delić, CTO VIP Mobile-a, da nas pozdravi. Hvala, Đađe. Dobar dan svima. Evo, vidim da je Hvala vam svima na interesovanju za ovaj challenge, u stvari ja to vidim kao da ste zainteresovani za našu budućnost, za našu digitalnu budućnost, jer ovde nije stvar VIP-a ili ICT Hub-a, ovo je stvar toga na koji način ćemo mi digitalizovati naše društvo. I kao što je rekao Đorđe, mi radimo VIP Mobile i ICT Hub rade već neko vreme na pripremi ovog challenge-a, ali nismo tu sami, imamo veliku podršku još nekih od naših partnera, profesora s elektrotehničkog fakulteta, Friedrich Neumann fondacije, Nokia i mikroelektronike. I tako svi mi zajedno smo probali da učinimo, da napravimo ovaj challenge pre svega sa ciljem da učinimo IoT tehnologiju dostupnom široj javnosti. Šta to znači? Mi verujemo da je IoT jedna od platformi za digitalizaciju društva i VIP Mobile implementira nerobend IoT tehnologiju i želimo da motivišemo javnost da razvija rešenja na ovoj tehnologiji. Zašto nerobend IoT? Šta je to specifično sa nerobend IoT-em? Jer ste čuli za neke druge IoT tehnologije ranije, pa nerobend IoT tehnologije je poslednja u nizu tih tehnologija, najmodernija u ovom momentu, već se pripremaju i neki novi standardi sa 5G-om, ali o tome ćemo za neku godinu, i ona se bazira na mobilnoj mreži četvrte generacije. Konkretno, u VIP mobilu mi ćemo koristiti postojići spektar na 800 MHz. Šta to znači sada za sve vas, za javnost? To znači da je to tehnologija koja vrlo lako može da bude dostupna svuda, A prednosti nerobend IoT tehnologije su što ona može da bude dostupna i recimo nekoliko metara ispod zemlje, tamo gde čak i nemamo signal, mobilni signal. Onda šta još možemo da kažemo o toj tehnologiji? Recimo sigurnost koja je velika tema, uvek sve u digitalno doba, Kada je u pitanju sigurnost, ovi uređaji komuniciraju kroz mobilnu mrežu i zaštićeni su sigurnosnim protokolima mobilne mreže. To daje jedan osjećaj, ja se nadam sigurnosti, koliko to može u ovo doba, je li tako? Sada možemo da znam, ali mislim, to svakako čini jako dobro obezbeđenom. Onda to je tehnologija, pošto imamo postojeću mobilnu infrastrukturu, koristimo licencirani spektar, to daje mnogo veću upravljivost takvim rešenjima, takvim IoT rešenjima, znači mnogo veći kvalitet usluge i servisa može da se obezbedi, a ne mora da se gradi neka nova mreža, da se grade neke nove stanice, da se postavi neki novi gateway, znači imamo malo i ona environmental efekt, gde ne moramo da postavljamo neku novu mrežu, koristimo već postojeće resurse i možda evo još jednu stvar, koja može da vam bude interesanta, moguće da se radi dvosmerna komunikacija sa uređajem i ograničenja u broju poruka koje se šalju i njihovoj dinamici zavise samo od baterije. Znači od toga koliko dugo želite da vam ta baterija traje uz uređaj, toliko možete da postavite frekvenciju i veličinu poruka, ali nemate realno neko ograničenje kao što postoji kod nekih drugih IoT tehnologija. To je oko te tehnologije, da malo pohvalim i nas iz VIP-a, mi ćemo zaista biti jedni od prvih u svetu koji ćemo ovu tehnologiju ponuditi široj javnosti. To nas zaista čini pionirima i ja moram malo i nas da pohvalim u tome, zato što smo se odvažili na ovaj korak. Šta je to što ćemo mi sada dati kroz ovaj challenge? Kroz ovaj challenge mi omogućavamo kompletno okruženje i podršku za razvoj i testiranje nerobend IoT rešenja. Znači, od hardvera, 
od čipseta i senzora do mobilne mreže, sa kompletnom mentorskom podrškom koja je potrebna za sve segmente razvoja tog rešenja. To je ono što zajedno sa partnerima omogućujemo. I šta tu još da vam kažem? Eto, sad sam se još malo. Da mislim da je jako bitno da svi razmišljamo o tome na koji način možemo da podignemo kvalitet života kroz digitalizaciju i neroband IoT tehnologija kao mobilna tehnologija koja je dostupna svima stvarno ima jedan ogroman potencijal. Mi stvarno verujemo da ima ogroman potencijal i da može da bude jako lako ili da kažemo lakše primenljiva u nekim velikim, velikim brojevima slučajeva oko nas. I zbog toga, evo i u ime kompanije VIP Mobile, želim da pozovem sve srednjoškolce, studente, razne eksperte, pravnike, ekonomiste, elektrotehničare, elektroničare, onda filozofe, psihologe, marketinške eksperte, PR stručnjake. Nemojte sada svi oni koji nisam pomenula da se slučajno osetite da nije to za vas. Ovo je za sve one koji imaju dobre ideje, koji imaju volju, koji imaju znanje i koji žele da se udruže sa svojim prijateljima, kolegama, naprave timove i prijave se lepo na VIP IoT Challenge, pa da zajedno gradimo našu digitalnu budućnost. Hvala vam. Hvala, Natali. Ući ćemo u detalje takmičenja nešto kasnije. Pre toga, Kosta Andrić, direktor ICT Hub-a. Hvala, Đorđe. Pozdrav svima, dobrodošli. Evo, Natalija smo imala razne neke zanimanja. Ja ću ispričati jednu anegdotu danas. Zvao me drugar koji je ortoped, to niste spomenuli. I pitao me kakve su vam to internet stvari. I sad ja kako što pitaš, pa kao, njegova supruga radi u jednoj IT kompaniji, kaže ona dolazi i sad ja moram da ja da uskučim za decu, šta su to internet stvari, čime svi to bavite. I mislim da je to upravo ta popularizacija o kojoj mi sad pričamo i deo digitalizacije društva, ali, ajde kažem, iz ugla ISTI Hub-a, mi želimo da budemo deo te inicijative da se digitalizuje naše društvo, ali čini mi se da ovakvi programi omogućavaju ljudima konkretne alate, eksperte, podršku, nagrade i svašta nešto da to zaista i uradite. Kada smo zajedno osnivali, tu zaista sva zahvalnost mom kolegi Đorđu, Garage Lab, jednu malu sekciju koja se bavi hardware scenom, onako vrlo skromno, mogli smo samo da maštamo i sanjamo ovakav dan. I zaista mogu da budem jako ponosan što se svi ovde večera, to zaista ne posmotramo kao nešto što je samo naše i svih naših partnera, i ETF-a, i Friedrich Neumana, i mikroelektronike, i Nokia, već svih onih ljudi koji su dolazili na meetupe Garaž Laba, kad nas je bilo 5, 7, 10, 15, 20, sada već na neki način i ta zajednica raste. I šta da kažem, iskoristite ovaj challenge, Sigurno da će biti napornog rada, ali mislim da se uvijek i dobro zabavimo. Tu nisu samo pozvani start-upi i drago mi da Natali zaista raširila malo taj spektar. Dakle, svako ko od mog prijatelja koji je danas možda saznao za IoT, malo googlao i raspitao se, mora da proveri da mu dolazi supruga, do ljudi za koje će možda ovo biti motivacija da se na ovaj način i povežu sa velikim telko operaterom, da to možda bude neki njihov put u preduzetništvu. Mi tu zaista vidimo našu lugu kao neko ko će da omoguće taj proces podrške i unapred se radujemo, uživamo i ja to vidimo se uskoro. Hvala. Hvala, Kosta. Now we will switch to English because of our keynote speaker for tonight. Uh, Jan Willem Smenk, the pioneer of IoT, one of the co-founders of Booking.com and the co-founder and CEO of uh, Sorak, uh, one of the leading uh, IoT companies that is especially dealing with the narrowband IoT that is going to be the topic of the night. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's really great to be here, and it's great to see that so many people of you uh, showed up. So it proves to me that uh, IoT as a subject, and uh, particularly narrowband IoT, is in everybody's focus here. And that's, that's good to learn, because it is going to have a very bright future. We're going to have hundreds of billions of IoT devices that all need to be made, and then we, we need developers, we need makers to start boosting this industry. But anyway, 
before we start, um, I'd like to introduce myself, Jan Willem Smeek, it's already been mentioned. I'm the, uh, the founder of uh, Sodak. Sodak is a company that pioneers in, in the Internet of Things since 2013. We were the first company in the world that uh, launched a narrowband IoT development board about one and a half years ago. And Holland was the first country in the world that had uh, countrywide narrowband IoT coverage. So that's why I was in invited to come over here and, uh, and share our experiences with, uh, with all of you here. Now, first, I would like to talk a little bit about the history and the future of computing. Um, com computers 75 years ago didn't exist. I mean, it was a thing that has been developed over that last time span starting about 75 years ago. And as you see in this chart, around 1950, there were a few thousand computers. Computers that were used predominantly in uh, governments, in maybe big banks. Uh, a handful of machines that were taking over a workload that uh, before that was only done by, uh, by hand. But a, a computer was, was far from, from personal. It was big mainframe machines and uh, not many people at that time expected that a computer would uh, eventually land on somebody's desk. But that started around 1975, so after the first 25 years in computing, the size of computers was brought down, down to some, something that could really stand on somebody's desk. In those days we were talking about mini computers mini variety of the big mainframe thing. So what you see here is the, the, the numbers were still very small. It only grew from 5,000 to 10,000 in a time span of 25 years. So that's how, how slowly uh, the, the computing industry uh, evolved. And then I think it was mainly Apple, but the, uh, the, the, the first guys that, uh, that really made a personal computer, a computer that people could afford, a, people, uh, a people's computer that everybody could have at home. And, and you see that the second 25 years, so from 1975 to, uh, to the year 2000, it, it really skyrocketed. We went from 10,000 computers to maybe half a million computers worldwide. And it, everybody said, whoa, that's exciting, but people already had the impression that, that that's about it. Once everybody has a computer on their desk, the market is saturated and the developments will probably slow down. But how wrong can you be? Because only a few years later, the handheld devices started coming. I still remember it started with the iPod. That was a very smart device. And then the iPhone came out. And then we had, had the iPad. And then, of course, Android came out. And before we knew, everybody in the world was carrying around a smart device with them. So the saturated market that everybody expected to see with the, uh, the personal computer wasn't saturated at all. People were buying another device and another device. And before we knew, we had billions of devices. Around 2009, we were talking about two and a half billion, it's a bit of echo here, sorry. Two and a half billion devices that, uh, that were carried around with us. We, what we were wearing in our pockets was, uh, was more power than, than the whole world had just 50 years, years earlier. And when people thought that as soon as everybody has a device, everybody has a pocket computer, everybody has a laptop computer, the market will be saturated, only at that time uh, the industry started connecting devices. No longer a person was communicating to the internet, but it was a device, a machine, an object that started con communicating. Of course, we all know the connected car, uh, particularly take, for instance, a, a Tesla car. A Tesla car is like a, a data center on wheels. But, but also other objects started communicating to the Internet. And this is what we call the Internet of Things. So the Internet of Things is an autonomous device that communicates to a service somewhere in the Internet, somewhere in, in the cloud. Now, this market is the market that is really skyrocketing now. The predictions are that by 2020 or 2022, there will be around 50 billion devices. So can you imagine, 50 billion connected devices, all connected to the internet. And it, it will grow bigger. It, it will be 100 billion, maybe 200 billion. It, 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 it's a huge, huge industry. And I'm really happy that we as Sodak have been pioneers in this industry for the last five years, because we, I hope from what we've been doing that we will be one of the bigger players in, in the future of this industry. And the fact that you all showed up here is that you guys are all keen to be part of that movement as well. Um, well, the, the, the great news is that Fit Mobile is now introducing this uh, narrowband uh, IoT network here in Serbia as, as one of the, uh, the early adopters in the world. And, uh, and you guys in this uh, challenge will be invited to make something that works and acts on this, uh, this narrowband IoT network. When we talk about IoT, we talk about the four pillars of IoT. 
to build an IoT device, you need to address four different areas uh, to make a good device. And these pillars, they consist of power. How do we power the device? Compute. What is the computing power that the device has? What's the computing power that the device needs to do what it uh, wants to do? The communicate pillar. So how does the device communicate with the internet? After all, we're talking about Internet of Things devices. So the device needs to talk to the internet. The communication is an integral part of it. And then the sensing and actuating component. So these four pillars I would like to address individually. To start with power. Now, powering IoT devices, you can think of a device that you can just plug into the wall. We've got wall sockets here everywhere. So you can make a device that you plug in the wall and you don't have to worry about power because there's plenty of power coming out of the wall. The problem is, by the time we will have 50 billion or 100 billion devices, we can no longer build this infrastructure. I think the world doesn't have enough copper to make enough cables to make all these sockets work. So we have to think of devices can, that can work without main power. Now, we could run something on a battery. Take, for instance, a simple Duracell. I can make an IoT device that works on a simple single Duracell battery. However, if we have these Duracell batteries in every device, by the time we have 100 billion devices and if the battery lasts for a year, then we're talking about, I believe, 1,000 Olympic swimming pools of battery waste a year. And again, the, the world may not have enough natural resources to produce all the batteries. So, preferably, we, we don't make a device whereby we need to change the battery very regularly. So, an option is potentially rechargeable batteries. So, we can put a battery in an IoT device that we recharge regularly, like, like your phone, but then I'm not saying that you want to recharge it on a daily basis, but let's say make a device that you need to recharge once every six months or once every year then at least the rechargeable battery will probably last for the whole life cycle of the battery and that would put less stress on the environment of all the batteries that we, uh, we will be dumping when they're empty. On the other hand, we may have devices that run for the whole lifespan on the battery. So there's a whole movement, for instance, in smart metering. You have a, a water meter or a, uh, another smart device that you want to install and you don't want to touch for 10 years. So my water meter is in my basement. Somebody installs it and it, it, they want it to run for 10 years. But that's a, a challenge in itself because the Duracell battery that I mentioned, if you buy a new one and you leave it in your drawer for three or four years, it's empty. It has a, a significantly higher uh, natural discharge than, uh, than, than what you would need to, uh, to operate the device for a much longer lifespan. So we've got specialized companies like Saft, for instance. They make uh, uh, lithium theanol chloride batteries. That's a different lithium te technology, which has a shelf life of about 25 to 30 years. So these batteries you could put in your device and you could make it for 10 years or even longer. So that's an interesting uh, idea as well, that the battery will have the same lifespan as that the whole device has. So these are the technologies that you should look into. Now, of course, renewable energy is the best way to go. If you can just harvest your energy from the environment, you can make a device that maybe doesn't even need a battery. Now, we all know uh, solar power as a source of renewable energy. And in fact, the name SODAC, the name of our company, stands for Solar Power Data Acquisition. Uh, our idea has always been that we want to make devices that run on renewable energy. And, and initially, solar was the, uh, was the best idea we, th we thought. But then I came to learn that there's lots of initiatives where people are harvesting energy from other sources. Think of kinetic energy. Or I, I like this one. This is a, a camp stove that if you go out camping and you make a nice fire, uh, or you cook a, a kettle of water or something, you can at the same time charge your, uh, your telephone. So it converts heat energy into electricity. So again, you may come up with an application whereby you have heat but you don't have electricity. This is a method of converting heat into electricity. So it's not just solar which is uh, the renewable energy source of uh, choice, but, but also, let's say, kinetic or uh, thermal energy are very interesting players uh, as it comes to energy harvesting. And if you harvest energy, you could buffer this energy, for instance, in a, in a large capacitor, in a supercapacitor, so you wouldn't need a battery at all. We've done lots of experiments of making little IoT devices that don't have a battery at all. Which is interesting because batteries, they contain uh, hazardous materials that you don't want to, uh, to go uh, and, 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 and ditch uh, in, in, a, in a improper way. Well, if you don't have a battery, you don't have to worry about that aspect. 
to make something run on a battery or to run on a renewable energy source, the first thing you need to do is to reduce the power because the less power you use, the less power you have to generate. It's like uh, your pocket money. The less you spend, the less money you need. Eh? It's, it's same, same with energy. So spend less energy. Now, how do we spend as little energy as possible? Well, it means that you need to sleep when you can. That's my life motto uh, anyway. Um, so you sleep when you can because IoT devices use very little energy when they sleep. And then you only work when you have to. It's also a good one. Eh? And finally, you only communicate briefly. Um, that's a bit harder for me to communicate briefly, but for IoT de devices it's really important that your communication time is short. Just to give you some examples. Sleeping when you can, an IoT device can wake from sleep in a very short time and it only uses a few microwatts when it's sleeping. So if you put the IoT device to sleep, it consumes so little energy, you could say that it uses less energy than your battery would uh, lose due to natural discharge. And like I said, you can wake it in less than a millisecond. It's not like your computer, when you close the lid and you make it to sleep, then you, when you open it up and you want it to restart, you can go for a cup of coffee before the computer is ready. No, the IoT device wakes in a millisecond. In one thousandth of a second, you go from a state of sleeping to a state of working. Now working, when I say work only when you, when you have to, you have to define for yourself what kind of work do you want to do. What is the purpose of the IoT device that you're building? What kind of work do you want it to do? And when do you want it to work? And when it works, how long will the work that you're doing take? I'd like to give you an example on this. It's to keep your duty cycle short. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. The example I'm giving here is if what you want to do is to measure a temperature, that's a typical IT thing, you make a device that measures a temperature. For instance, in transport and logistics, if you have these uh, this trucks that are transporting uh, perishable goods, you put a temp temperature sensor in there. That's a typical IoT solution. Now measuring a temperature, how often do you want to do that? Normally you don't have to measure more than once in every five minutes the temperature. Because the temperature in your food truck or the temperature in this room doesn't really change all that much in a minute. It takes a longer time to change, so you don't have to measure every minute. You don't have to measure every second, you measure every five minutes. And if you measure uh, a temperature, a typical IoT device can measure a temperature in about two milliseconds. So like I said, you can have a sleeping microcontroller, you wake it, you measure a temperature, you go back to sleep. So the time that you're active, your duty cycle, in fact, is two milliseconds per five minutes. And two milliseconds per five minutes is 0.016% of the time. So that's the amount of time you're working. The rest you're sleeping, the rest you're hardly using any energy. So that's an interesting thing to keep in mind if you're designing these devices. Now, communicating briefly is an important one because communication takes a lot of power. It takes much more power than anything else you're trying to do. So what you want to do is you only open your communication channel when you need to open it. The rest of the time you close the communication and you send a minimum amount of data. So you try to keep the headers as short as possible. If you identify the device, you identify it by, for instance, 8 bytes and not by 32 bytes. Um, so you send a minimalistic amount of data to keep your time on air as short as possible. Um, it, is, it has two benefits if you send a minimalistic amount of data. First of all, your device is on for a shorter time, so you conver, uh, conserve battery in it. And also, you occupy the, the, uh, the airwaves much shorter than when you send, when you send a long um, uh, array of data. It's also in the benefit of all the other users of the network, because the, 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 the less you use the network, the more time there is for other devices. If we're going to talk about 100 billion IoT devices, we want these devices to use the radio spectrum that we're all using as efficient as possible. So this is the thing, eh? you sleep, you wake up, you work, you sleep, you wake up, you work, and every now and then you step out to communicate. For instance, if you read the temperature every five minutes, 
you could send it to the internet every hour. So you take 12 readings, put it in one data frame, you send it to the internet and you disconnect just to cons conserve power. So that's the power story. Now the compute story. The compute story is, is, a, is a, a truly interesting one because computers are very powerful and very cheap these days. Important, where do we want to do this computing? The computing we can be done on the IoT device or the computing can be done in the cloud. And that's a huge discussion that we're having because in the cloud, in the internet, we have unlimited resources for our computing and typically the IoT device has much more limited resources. So we have to find the right balance to what we can do on the device and what we can do in the cloud. Take for instance the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is an extremely powerful little computer. It costs next to nothing and it performs, it performs better than the average laptop did five years ago. All in a tiny little thing that costs next to nothing. So you could do a lot of computing in your Raspberry Pi. The only problem is, is the Raspberry Pi, in comparison to true IoT devices, uses an enormous amount of power. When I say an enormous amount of power, the Raspberry Pi could use two watts of power continuously. Well, two watts of power continuously, in comparison to what we're burning with all these lights here, is nothing. But two watts continuously, in terms of an IoT device that needs to run on a battery, is way too much. So we always say, don't use a fully flexed type of de device like the Raspberry Pi, but rather use something on basis of a microcontroller. Now, people often ask me, a microcontroller, what is a microcontroller? Well, a microcontroller is what you see here on somebody's uh, finger. A microcontroller is a computer on a chip. To make an IoT device on base of a microcontroller, these are all the components that you need. You need a microcontroller, you need a crystal uh, for, for your clock, and you need a few auxiliary components, and then you have an IoT device. So a microcontroller is a computer on a, chi on a chip. A computer normally consists of a processor, it consists of memory, like random access memory and read-only memory, a place to store your, uh, your program files, and a place of memory that you can use for your uh, computations and operations. And you need some peripherals, some, some communications, some input-output ports. Well, in a normal computer, those are all spread out over your computer mainboard, but in a microcontroller, it's all embedded in a single chip. And these chips, these days, cost less than two euro. So for less than two euro, you, you buy a computer that in fact has the same computing power as that NASA had in 1969 when they put the first man on the moon. So the whole data center of NASA, all the computers that NASA had in 1969 com combined, had less computing power as this single chip. It's fascinating, huh? Like I said, it's an amazing 32 bits uh, power. Well, what we see is in the, the olden days, microcontrollers used to be 8 bit, but most of the people in the industry have, have switched to 32 bit microcontrollers because you have indeed all the power that you need to make a powerful Internet of Things device. But we still have the cloud. Huh? We send data to the cloud because in the cloud we can do things that you cannot imagine you're doing on this little microcontroller. And then again, you want the microcontroller to sleep most of the time. So sometimes you want to bring computing to the cloud instead of doing the computing locally. Um, but if you want to process all your data in the cloud, it means that all the data that comes from your sensors, all the measurements that you're taking, you need to send to the cloud to process. And that again takes a lot of bandwidth, and bandwidth is money and it takes a lot of energy. So you need to find the balance between what you send to the cloud and what you process locally. And what we see these days is that people start talking now about smart hybrid solution. A smart hybrid solution is that you do some processing on the local device and some processing in the cloud and you try to find the balance between them. They also often talk about edge computing, for instance, in that uh, analogy. Now, what we often propose is that you say you temporarily upload the data of your sensors to the cloud, and then you use machine learning, artificial intelligence, in the cloud to create an algorithm to analyze this data and to draw conclusions of the data that you've gathered. 
Now, this algorithm that you've defined in the cloud, you could then send back to the IoT device, and you could implement that al algorithm on the IoT device and do the processing locally. And when you do the process locally, you don't have to send all the big stream of data to the cloud, but you could only send the outcome of the processing to the cloud. So that's, that's the kind of how we could hybridly use the cloud and the device to come to the most optimal situation. The fourth pillar of IoT is the communication pillar. And that's most likely the, the reason that we're all here. That's, that's why Fit Mobile has invited us all to come do, doing this. To make an IoT device, it's a device connected to the internet, so it should be able to communicate to the internet. Now, what flavors do we have in communicating to the internet? Well, we define that in four different categories. We have personal area networks, local area networks, wide area networks, and global area networks. And it's basically defined by the range that the device has. So in the personal area network, the communication between the device and its peer is maybe up to 10 meters, while the global area network covers the whole world. If we talk about the country-wide network that, for instance, VipMobile is deploying, we're talking about a wide area network. Now, personal area networks. Personal area networks, that is devices to communicate over a short distance. For instance, contactless payments using NFC or RFID is uh, a method of uh, personal area networks. Very short distance you communicate. Or a better example, use Bluetooth Low Energy. Take a smartwatch that talks to a smartphone and you have uh, a local network created. It, this is something that we shouldn't underestimate. There's a lot of things that you can do by using this, this short distance communication um, to later on send the data, for instance, from your smartphone to the internet. Just to give you an example, we, we are developing a device that is actually a Fitbit for cows. We want to monitor the, the, uh, the health state of the cows. Go Holland is, is a, uh, a dairy country, we've, we, we've got millions of cows, and we, we would like to monitor the fitness of the cow. So what we made for the cow is a little ear tag, I'll show that later, or a, a little collar, that communicates to the internet. But we want to measure, for instance, the body temperature of the cow. So together with Wageningen University, one of the leading agricultural universities in Holland, we're working on a concept whereby we put a thermometer in the ear of the cow that sends the temperature over Bluetooth to the collar that the cow is wearing to send it again to the internet. So that's combining personal area networking with the wide area networking. Second category is local area network, networks that we use predominantly indoors. Uh, these are a couple of the tools that I have at home. A smart uh, switching system that I can remotely switch my lights on and off. A smart th uh, thermostat for my, uh, my devices at home. All devices that are operating in-house, what you see they are predominantly mains powered. In-house we have electricity, so all the devices that you see over the years developed for home automation are mainly mains powered. Protocols used are often Wi-Fi, plus some, some other variants like ZigBee and Z-Wave that are used for the indoor communication. Relatively short distance, uh, cheap to deploy devices, but not very useful if we go outside. If, if we want to communicate from anywhere in the world, uh, well, if we really want to communicate from anywhere, we need a global network. So I'm skipping the wide area network for a bit. Global networks mean that you have a device that communi can communicate from anywhere. In the middle of the ocean, the tip of, tip of the North Pole, anywhere you are, you can communicate if you have a global area network device. Now, for global area communicating, there's only one communication solution, and that's satellites. A satellite is basically a relay for your information stream. Um, the satellite communication was invented by a science fiction writer called Arthur C. Clarke. It's, he's from 2001 Space Odyssey and things like that. So he was actually an author, but also a scientist. And somewhere in the early 1940s, he said, if we launch three satellites and we place these satellites at 40,000 kilometers from Earth, their angular speed will be the same as the angular speed of the Earth rotating. So it, they will appear for us to stand still. Of course, they fly through space with a, a huge speed, but they appear to be uh, at a constant speed for us or a constant position for us. So that 40,000 kilometers away, that's what we call Clark's Belt, in honor of the old uh, Arthur C. Clarke, and that's where we find our geostationary satellites. 
Well, this is still a very commonly used method of communication. If you see a big ocean going boats, uh, they have satellite dishes that communicate with these geostationary satellites. And this gives you on your, your, your cruise ship or even, uh, even flying Air Serbia these days, you can, you can uh, surf the internet from sitting in, uh, in the plane because the plane communicates directly via satellite to a, uh, to a base station. The only thing is that this type of communication is not really suitable for IoT because you, use, you need a massive satellite dish and you need a lot of power as well. Now, there's another alternative that was started maybe some 10 years ago. The first company that, that, that went global with this is a company called Iridium. Iridium, they, uh, they had the plan to launch 77 satellites. I think the, the element number of uh, the element Iridium is 77. Any chemists in here? But eventually, they didn't launch 77 satellites, they launched 66 satellites. And with 66 satellites flying around the Earth, they make sure that wherever you are, you can pick up one of them and you send your, your data via that satellite. The Iridium satellites, like most of the low orbiting satellites, fly somewhere between 6 and 800 kilometers away. So a huge difference between 40,000 or 600 and, or 800 kilometers. So these low orbiting satellites can be reached by smaller devices and particularly IoT devices. And there's a lot of small companies coming up now. For instance, Hyber is a company in Holland that are now launching satellites that allow you to send, whenever the satellite flies over, a message. Well, Hyber will have one satellite this year. That satellite flies around the Earth and you can send a message at a given time only once a day. But it can be a very small device and they will be charging around four euro per year to send your information uh, to the satellite. One message a day, four euro per year. So about, about one cent per message. And as if you have a little boat that goes out on the ocean, as soon as you are 30 miles out, satellites are the only way of communicating. And if these cheap systems come in, it could be very interesting. But that's not what we're here for. We're here for wide area networking. Wide area networking, originally, if we, we looked 10 years ago, we would call that machine to machine communication. And machine-to-machine -machine communication was mainly by using a 2G SIM card via the 2G GPRS network, you would communicate. The, the, everybody always talks about the example of having one of these Coca-Cola vending machines. If the last tin of Coke is out, it will send a message, send me more Coke to fill it, fill it up. So these devices, they have mains power, so they can use the massive power that it needs to use 2G. Uh, and and they, uh, they will use the traditional telephone networks. Not suitable for what we want to do with IoT. So therefore, a low-power technology was needed. And the first company that came out with a low-power technology was Sigfox. Sigfox, a French company that really understands that what we want is a battery-powered device that works for many years. So they launched this technology and it was rather rapidly developed. But as rapidly as it was developed, it was also abandoned by a lot of people because it was lacking the features that we really need. Shortly after, LoRa was a, a protocol that came out. You must have heard of LoRa. It's also popular. It will also be uh, available here, uh, or is available in some places here in Serbia already. And the latest uh, to the, in, in this lineup is narrowband IoT. And narrowband IoT is a technology that is driven by the telcos and launched by Fitmobile. So how, do we, how did we get to narrowband IoT? If we look at about the evolution over time of uh, the mobile communication, we saw that we had 2G, and then everybody said it's too slow. I cannot stream music, I cannot stream video, I need more bandwidth. And the answer of the telcos was, well, then we give you 3G. Give you more bandwidth, it uses a bit more power, but you want more bandwidth, you get more bandwidth. And then when people said, yeah, but it's not good for watching uh, YouTube movies all day, then the telco said, okay, we'll give you 4G. And they gave you 4G, and it was again using more power, and it gave you more bandwidth. So these technologies were not really suitable for what we needed for the uh, Internet of Things. And then this player Sigfox came into the market. Sigfox addressed the fact that you could do with much less bandwidth as long as it would use less power. So that was a clever move and that really shook the, uh, the IoT industry or the telco industry and they started thinking of, oh, we need to, we need to come up with alternatives. So, so they, they had several launches of CAT1, CAT-M1, CAT-NB1, that is narrowband IoT, to, to address the interest in the market to, you, to have these technologies available. So now you see in this playing field, narrowband IoT, LoRa, Sigfox, that is what we're looking at at the moment. Now, if I compare Sigfox, LoRa and narrowband IoT, there's a couple of striking things that you will see there. 
it is the driven by the spectrum that we're using for the technology. LoRa and Sigfox are using 868 megahertz. That's one of the ISM bands. That's one of the bands that can be freely used by everybody. Other ISM bands examples are, for instance, 2.4 gigahertz. Everybody can use 2.4 gigahertz for the Wi-Fi, and that's where the problem starts. Because if, if everybody is using it, then congestion is the likely thing to happen. At Sigfox, they said, okay, guys, we're going to behave nicely, all of us, so we, we're going to avoid congestion by limiting our users about the number of messages they can send and the size of the message. So in Sigfox, you can send 12 bytes. And you can only send that 140 times per day. So the amount of data that you can send is fairly limited. That limits the, the practical use of Sigfox as a technology. The other thing with Sigfox is that it's a single direction yeah, communication channel. The device can communicate to the cloud, but there's no return path. So you send the message, and all you can do is sit down, hope, and pray that your message arrives on the network. That never gave me a very comfortable feeling. Uh, what, we, what also didn't give me a very comfortable feeling is that Sigfox never told you that the system worked that way. So I was really excited, Sigfox, oh, we're going to do it. So, so I booked a plane to Toulouse in France to the Sigfox headquarters. There was a five-day workshop on uh, Sigfox. I joined in. I wanted to learn everything about the technology. And on the first day, they told me, yeah, it only communicates one direction. So I said, how do I know that my message arrived? Yeah, you don't. So said, well, it's not really suitable then for mission-critical applications. They managed to make it very low power. And also they managed to make it really cheap. So if you can make a device that really uh, needs to communicate and it's not 100% important that the messages arrive or it's good enough if 95% if, if of the messages arrive but you want to do it cheap and you want to do it over a long time, then Sigfox may be a solution. Now, LoRa came out around, around the same time and they saw that 12 bytes is, is a bit too little for doing serious work. So in LoRa they said we up that to 51 bytes. If you can send 51 bytes, you can actually send a, a, a fair deal of data. We, we, at Sodak we make a little uh, LoRa based uh, tracker. In the 51 bytes we managed to pack um, the geo position of the device, so latitude, longitude, altitude, speed, heading, temperature, uh, battery voltage, so it's, it's something like 12 variables of information we managed to pack in at 51 bytes and that then can be processed and nicely charted on, uh, on your, uh, your dashboard uh, with, with that, that you would be, be using to, uh, to display the data of your device. So 51 bytes made it much, much more practical. But with LoRa again, they said your limitation is 300 messages per day. So again, I feel that, that sometimes I'm, I'm running into a wall in, in terms of what the usability is of the technology. It's still in the same unlicensed spectrum. So it is cheap. You can run your own private network using LoRa. The power consumption is very low. But if we really want to make something that we say, this is what we use for our, for our true business processes, the answer that the telcos gave is probably a much better one. With narrowband IoT, your message size can be much bigger. You can send up to 1,024 bytes in a single frame. Um, the number of messages that you can send depends on the bundle that you're buying from your operator. So it could be 100 messages a day, but it could also be 2,000 messages a day, all depending on what you want to pay to your, to your telco. There's no regulation options there. It's just a financial option. Um, you can acknowledge the messages that you sent. You can know for sure that the message that you've sent has arrived. And that's, that's a very important one. It's, that, 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 to me, is the crucial element in, in a proper IoT communication, that you know for sure you've sent a message, it has arrived where it needs to arrive. Um, and the power consumption, because of the fact that you are monitoring whether your message arrives or not, the power consumption is somewhat higher than of the LoRa and Sigfox. You're looking at maybe three, four times higher than the other technologies. Still way cheaper than 2G, but you, you pay for the functionality that you get. Now, narrowband IT started in 2014, so it's a fairly new technology. It, uh, there was a study written by the 3GPP. The 3GPP is the umbrella organization of the telephone companies. So the 3GPP said, we want this new technology. And now, what they, they, like they, they used to do, they make huge books in which they write down every feature, every detail of, of what the technology should look like before they start implementing. So I read the whole thing. It was 800 pages. It was really... Uh, 
It was a very boring weekend, but yeah, it was raining, so I thought I'll, I'll read this paper. And I picked up, let's say, five points of importance out of the design of, uh, of narrowband IoT. First of all, the 3GPP said these devices need to be cheap. To be successful, to have hundreds of billions of devices, the devices need to be cheap. So what they defined is to make it a success, the module should be less than five euro. Well, at the time I was reading that, a typical 3G module to impl implement in your device would cost about 35 euro. So seven times more than what they are targeting the narrowband IoT devices. Now, in all honesty, we're not there yet. The module is still in the range of about 10 euro, but still significantly cheaper than, uh, than 2G and 3G modules. The other thing they said is that the signal should travel further than in a typical 2G network. So they say we need a, a bigger link budget, that's, that's how they called it in radio technology, and so they defined that the link budget should be 10, 20 dB better than the 2G. Well, decibels are in a logarithmic scale, but trust me, 20 dB means that you have a 10 times stronger signal on narrowband IoT than you have on 2G. So if you go somewhere in a place that you only have one bar on your phone uh, with, a, with a 2G, you know you will have full bars with narrowband IoT. The other thing is that they say is that the capacity to accommodate 100 billion devices globally, the network should be able to handle more devices. So in a single cell, on a single uh, antenna, uh, 100 devices should be able to, to register itself. That's about 100 times more than you would have with uh, 2G phones. So you could register 1,000 phones or you can register 100,000 uh, IoT devices in a single cell. The design also specified that the battery life should be long. Uh, they were talking about a device that can work on a single pen line battery for 10 years, provided that the device sends one packet a day. So if I'm talking about a smart water meter that you install in your basement, it sends the water reading once every day. It should be able to do that on a battery for, uh, for 10 years. And, yeah, moderate latency. Your, your message should be sent and, and be arrived at its destination within a short time of approximately 10 seconds. In, in voice communication, 10 seconds latency is, is killing the system. Eh? If, if you, say, you say something and you have to wait for 10 seconds before the other person hears it, uh, we, we're back to the old radio days that you say over after every uh, line that you've spoken. But in IoT, 10 seconds is just a, a perfect latency for a device. You will not notice uh, it at all. But most important, it's part of the 4G standard. Um, with 4G voice communication, let's say 95% was al already there. They only had to make a couple of tweaks to, uh, to enable uh, narrowband IoT before they can make it operational. And you're part of this whole reliable infrastructure. Um, what, what you see in the base stations, all the base stations typically are uh, software-defined radios. So often to deploy a narrowband IoT network on the, on the telco side, it's just a matter of uh, flashing new firmware in your, uh, your, uh, your base stations and you're there. The network is working. And the network is working as reliable as it is on, uh, on the 4G on your phone, but now for narrowband IoT. So th these are all uh, pretty good reasons to, uh, to adopt this technology. Now we talked about power consumption. I don't want to go into uh, very much detail, but what is important is that it uses the most power when the device just connects. So you, you fire it up, you connect, it uses a lot of power. Then if you have a message to send, you send the message and you wait for a little bit is what, what they call paging. You wait a little bit for an answer to come back to you. And after that, you bring the device in a deep sleep. It's called power safe mode. If you are in power safe mode, the device can no longer receive data. You have to wait when the device comes back on. But then the network will ensure that all the messages that are queued for you are coming in in, an, in the appropriate way. So if you look at the, the, the theoretical thing, what we did is we, we tested it. We say, okay, what does the power uh, usage look like in real life? Um, there's, there's a magic device called an OT, it's O-T-I-I, -I. It's, it's, it's a very accurate uh, uh, current measurement uh, tool and we always use that up to measure what, what the real uh, electricity flow is in powering an IoT device. So what, what I said to my team, send an IoT message and record the pattern of what it takes uh, to send this IoT message. Now what you see is we send a single what we call UDP datagram. Over here the device is in deep sleep in the power safe mode. You see the line is shown at zero. In, in effect it's using a few micro amps. So, it, so it's of such a small scale that you, you won't see it here. And then the device wakes up, it, it reattaches itself to the network, it sends the message and it goes back to sleep. And it goes back to sleep 
in a time, this overall time from sleep to sleep is 3.1 seconds. And the power consumption to use this is 70 microwatts. So you can easily calculate now if you have a device that needs to work for a year and send one message a day. You have to multiply 70 microwatts with 365. So we, we're talking about a total of uh, about 30 milliwatt hours in total power usage to send a message every day. And that is something that a very small battery can easily handle. You have a maximum power peak of around 115 milliamps. That is quite significant, it's more than the Sigfox and uh, LoRa radios will use, but it's only about 1 20th of what a 2G radio takes. 2G radios peak up to 2 amps, and this peaks up to 115 milliamps. So that also makes all your power uh, circuitry and your battery, etc., way smaller than you would have with the, the, the 2G uh, configuration. Now you need to keep in mind that it takes some energy to establish your first session. So you switch the device up and you uh, attach it to the network, um, but you only have to do that once. It is advised that you attach, but you never deattach. Your device stays attached. Even if you go in deep sleep, in the lowest power mode, you stay attached to the network. Because if you stay attached, you can wake up, send, and you go back to sleep in just a few seconds. So also, always, only, uh, also if you only send a message once a day, still it makes sense to stay attached. So establishing session takes more energy. Another feature, what they call extended uh, EDRX, to the extended uh, receive windows, whereby you listen more often than you're sending, takes extra energy. So you have to take that into account. So best practice for a low power device is that you, you make the device only receive incoming messages shortly after you send the message. So you keep the radio on for a bit. Like here, during this period of time, the radio was on, the, the, the base station knows that the radio is on. If it had a message for you, it would send the message at that instance. And if there's no message, you know you can switch off the radio. Now, narrowband IoT is, uh, can be very easily implemented by telcos because the, the, the slot that narrowband IoT uses is 180 kilohertz, so it fits in a 200 kilohertz uh, GSM slot. So if you're still operating a GSM network, you can say, well, we've got all these GSM slots. We repurpose one of the GSM slots for uh, narrowband IoT, and the rest of the network uh, continues operating. So that's a very easy way of implementing it. If, however, it, if, as a telco, you've already migrated to LTE, to 4G, you can still take one of these GSM slots and use it in-band. It's basically that that little section is cut out of the, uh, the total LTE scope and dedicated for narrowband IoT. So it's a very easy way that the telco can implement it. But the true beauty uh, of narrowband IoT lies in the fact that you could also play it, place it in the guard band. If you had two LTE channels, these two channels are separated from each other to avoid interference by putting a little 200 kilohertz stop in there where you have no communication so that the two don't interfere. Well, narrowband IoT could be put in that place and still not interfere with LTEM. It still do its work in a, in a piece of bandwidth that, that basically is free for the operators. So this, this is a, an interesting one. Um, LTE band could operate in a different, uh, of narrowband IT operates in a different LTE band. What we see most commonly in Europe is to use band 8, that's a center frequency of 900 megahertz, or to use band 20, a center frequency of 800 megahertz. I understand that here in uh, Serbia, uh, it band 20 will be the band of choice for, uh, for narrowband IoT. Okay, pillar 4 is the sensing and actuating. Now, you make an IoT device because you want to send something or do you want to take a certain action. Now, what could you do with IoT? So, I pulled up this picture of the internet and it says, well, this is what you can do with uh, an IoT. You can measure air pollution, huh? or you can measure wa water quality, or you can make a tracking device that follows shipping containers, or you can make a parking sensor that sees if a parking slot is empty, or you can make a smart bin for uh, collection rubbish. Well, to me, this picture shows that what you can do with IoT stretches as far as your imagination. So if you have an idea, work it out, build it. IoT is, uh, is the network technology for it. So I worked out a couple of these examples to demonstrate for you. Um, first one is the parking sensor. This here is a narrowband IoT-based parking sensor. You can place this parking sensor just by tr drilling a hole, putting it in the ground, and you make it send a message every time a car comes and every time a car goes. 
little thing, 10 centimeters diameter, could work for three years on the inbuilt battery and could send a message every time you see a car change position. Because of the better penetration in the ground, narrowband IoT will not suffer from the fact that this thing is built into the ground and it will not suffer from the fact that the car is parked over it. So you need that little bit of extra juice that narrowband IoT has to offer you um, to make this happen. So this, this is a, a real life example of narrowband IoT. Or the smart bin. People talk a lot, a lot about smart bins. Yeah, smart bins is really something that you could do really, really well with, I, with IoT because you want the bin to be emptied when it's full. It, the, the current mode of operation of all these, uh, these operators, that, the, the garbage collectors, is that they have a, this same round that they do every week. And they empty all the bits, whether they're full or not, they empty them. Now, if we put sensors in, we can do some smart routing, that they follow a route that is way shorter, saving energy, saving fuel, to collect the ones that really need to be empties. Bridge sensing. Bridge sensing is one of our uh, favorite uh, projects. This is, uh, this is our invention. This here is a boom that closes just before the bridge opens. And in that boom, we have a sensor that measures the state of the boom. It's, it's, it's a very simple tilt sensor. It says closed, open, closed, open. It doesn't do any more than this. Well, why is this relevant? It is the Dutch government that came to us and they said, if a bridge opens, normally a line of cars start building up. They all leave their engine running, so that creates a lot of pollution, particularly for the people that are living there. You see the flat building on the other side of the people road. These people suffer under the fact that the bridge is open. They said, so if we can send information about the state of the bridge to Google and all the other uh, navigation apps, they can reroute the traffic as soon as the bridge opens. So they asked me, can you make a si system that signals if the bridge opens? I said, well, it's really simple. The, the, there's a guy there that pushes a button, the bridge goes open. If I take the two wires from the button, put a little transmitter there, I'm in business. And I said, no, no, no. You cannot interfere with our infrastructure. If you put electronics in our operator panel in the bridge console, yeah, then people could hack it. The, the, the hackers can open the bridge remotely. Yeah? Or uh, ISIS can come and they could cause chaos in Holland. And all the paranoia of the government came up. They said, you're only allowed to build a device if it's not connected to our infrastructure. Well, then I said, if it needs to be detached from the infrastructure, I put a little box on the boom, and I only make it act on the motion of the boom. So it's not electrically con connected. This thing works on a single AA battery for 10 years. Or in agriculture. Agriculture is a huge market for IoT. This is a soil moisture probe. This soil moisture probe measures the amount of moist in the ground. Plants need water to grow. But the amount of water that I need is pretty defined. So what does it mean? That the farmers do irrigation. You know, a farmer walks out of his house and he thinks, well, it's pretty dry. I put on the irrigation. There's no science behind it. There's no logic behind it. I've never even seen a farmer putting his finger in the ground. It's all done uh, by what he thinks is uh, his, his natural uh, knowledge of farming. Well, pesticides is another uh, subject, but in this case it's water. Water is becoming precious, so we don't want to waste water. We want to know how much water we put in the ground. But not just that, we want to measure the water at the root level of the crop that the farmer is growing. That even makes it more complicated. I was at a coffee farm in East Africa uh, some months ago, and I said to the guys, do you want to measure your soil moisture level? Yes, I said, yes. I said, at what depth? They said, well, coffee plants are rooting at about 3 meters 60. So they say, I, I'm not interested at all how much water there is in topsoil. I'm interested at 3 meters 60. So for a farmer, it's impossible to go and check what the water level at 3 meters 60 is, unless you dig in a probe and you leave it there, and you make the thing send to the internet what the soil moisture is. That way you can do the irrigation exactly, precisely to what the plant needs. This again is a Sodak project. We started with the, uh, the collar. So this is a little thing that the cow wears around the neck. It has a solar panel of half a watt. 
and it, it can do magic. It can, it can send the position of the cow every five, every 10, or every 15 minutes. We send where the GPS position is of the cow. It has some more uh, knowledge built in. It has the Bluetooth transmitted uh, uh, built in that can communicate with the other devices. So that's really a smart hub that the cow is wearing around the neck. And we were really proud of it uh, until we started talking to farmers. Uh, particularly farmers in Australia said, well, you want our device? And they said, no. And I said, why don't you want our device? They said, well, it's, it's lethal for the cow. They start walking around, they get entangled around the, uh, a tree, and they, they kill themselves. The farmer said, we're going to lose cows if we're going to use uh, your thing. So they came to us and they said, you have to make a thing that the cow can wear, wear in the ear. It can weigh 40 grams, and the maximum size is 45 by 35 millimeters. It needs to last for five years and it needs to send the GPS position every 15 minutes. So we had a bit of a challenge there, but we managed to build it, and we managed to build a device with a solar panel that produces 0.18 watts. So that's about 25, 30 times less than the other solar panel, but we still managed by efficiently dealing with the power, like I showed in the earlier slides, we managed to make this device do exactly what it, uh, what it needs to do. And that's particularly because we, we're using a very efficient energy harvesting chip in there. The one of my favorites is the, the mouse trap. You know, a mouse trap, as soon as it has caught a mouse, it's no longer active. So if you want the best yield out of your mouse trap, if, if you want to justify the business case of having a mouse trap, you want to empty it as soon as the mouse is in there. So you want the transmitter, I've caught a mouse, you could go there, take the mouse out. At least, that's what I thought initially, what the business case behind the mousetrap was. Until experts in the field said no, we want to know if it has a, a mouse in there, because after three days, we're going to have a horrible smell. So this is more to prevent uh, your uh, office to be unusable than to, uh, to really get better efficiency out of your mousetrap. Adaptive street lighting. I mean, it, it, it's a waste of energy that in a street where no cars are driving, that the street lights are at maximum power. And particularly with, with the latest uh, LED technology, we can run street lights at 0%, at 10%, or at 90%. So we can control by putting sensors in the road or by the side of the road. We can see if there's any traffic moving, and then we can switch off sections of light to, uh, to show the, the cars that need the light and, and, and keep the rest dark and cozy and save energy and bike sharing. In Holland, uh, we've got lots and lots of bikes. Everybody has at least two or three bikes, and particularly because bikes get st stolen regularly, so you have to always have a spare bike. But it's much more efficient to have a bike sharing system. If you have a bike sharing system that you can use any bike by just open the lock with your smartphone, it's, a, it's an amazing uh, working field for, uh, for IoT. It's particularly popular in, in, in China, for instance. The, the bike sharing market is huge there. This one was a study we did for uh, Bayer. That's the, uh, the German uh, chemicals uh, company. And they say, we, 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 we make certain chemicals that in a five liter container cost about a thousand euro. So that stuff, we would actually like to know when the uh, container is opened. So can you come up with an idea how we can measure the opening of the uh, container? So we made this seal structure. This is paper with a little copper line in there that if they twist the cap, the paper tears, and the copper line gets cut, so the device knows exactly when the seal is opened. When the seal is opened, the microcontroller in there starts working. It knows that the, the maximum use time of the, uh, the product is, for, for instance, four weeks. So after four weeks, the red LED goes on, like no longer use. So that's beneficial for the owner of the product. But on the other side, when the seal gets triggered by opening, a message goes to buyer, so they know that the last container that this farmer, for instance, was using is now in use, so they can restock the local distributor with this chemical. So you can make the whole logistic lines way shorter than they were in the past. So we did a study for buyer, and they said, how much is this device, how much, how much can it cost in production? And the guy at, far, uh, at buyer said, well, let's say four, uh, four euro. We said, four euro? If I make 10,000 of these today, with the specs that you are asking me, that would cost around 40 euro. So I can't do this for four euro. But the guy, he had a lot of wisdom in him. He said, uh, but I don't need it today. 
we are now developing ideas and concepts that need to be deployed in 10 years from now. In 10 years from now, this device can be 4 euro. So I said to him, how do you know for sure? He said, well, this is very simple. That, that phone of yours, these phones used to cost $700 10 years ago. You buy a phone with the same technical capabilities in, sh in China now for seven. So in 10 years time, electronic devices can become 100 times cheaper. So why can't we make this for four dollars? And I think he was totally right. So also, if you come up with an idea that is not feasible today, well, still work on it, still keep it in your portfolio because there will be a time that it becomes feasible. Now, there's some common misunderstandings that we need to address because I got a lot of people coming to our offices and they say, uh, oh, IoT devices only cost a few euro. Not the buyer guys that look far in the future, but there's a lot of people that think that today IoT costs a few euro. It doesn't cost a few euro. Any IoT device these day, days is 50 euro or more. So keep that in mind. So don't let yourself mislead it by a business case that is not profitable. I had, uh, uh, I saw Aholt on the sign there. They, that's one of the, the big supermarket chains in Holland. They came to us and they said, we want for the, the shopping carts in our shops, I want the tracker. I said, why do you want the tracker for the shop? He says, we're losing 10% of our cars per year. I can't imagine why and how, but he was, he was adamant. Well, there's a couple of things. You, you, you can make nice toys for your kids. Eh? There's pretty decent wheels under there, so uh, you can convert it into something really useful if you take one home. But he said, we're losing 10% of our shopping carts. And so we are scouting the market now to see who can make these IoT devices. I said, okay, you lose 10%. How much does a card like that cost? And he looked at me, hmm, that's a strange question to ask. He'd been to three other companies already. Eh? I said, well, for me it's an essential question because it's, it's very simple arithmetic. You lose 10% of your cards. They cost 150 euro, he said to me. So your budget to save your cars from not being stolen is 15 euro per year. For 15 euro per year, you want to fit a device, you want to power a device, you want a device to communicate, you want to buy a communication channel, all within 15 euro. I said, it's not feasible today. Come back in five years. The guy was a bit offended, but for me, it's, it's a very simple justification that it's not possible. Now, unless you enrich the business case with other features. The guy said, I want to track the card when it's missing. But what if you don't track it when it's missing, but if you track it all the time? If you use the same logic to see which path people are following through the supermarket. If you can then rearrange in the supermarket where the goods are that they are picking, people may buy one or two percent more goods during their shopping visit than they used to do. Now if you then work out what your financial benefit is from what you learn from this device, maybe the device is worth 100 euro per year because your business case is totally different. So if you des design and think of something, think of the business case to start with. The other thing is that people say, oh, IT devices are super small, they're, they're, they're this big. And not just this big, it, for us, it largely depends on the size of the battery. The size of the battery, they say, yeah, it, and, but it works for many years on a small battery. Everybody says, like, we make an IoT device, we put a little coin cell in there, and that's the little contrapment, and that works for 10 years. Yeah, it could work for 10 years, but it depends on the number of messages that you're sending, because that takes the energy. I, I once had a company coming to my office, and they said, well, we have these air conditioner units. We want to make an independent air conditioning monitoring system. So it's a little device, he, he, he drew, drew to me what he had in mind, he says a little matchbox that I stick to the ceiling and it measures the temperature and the humidity, sends it to the cloud so I know when to do maintenance on these devices. He says that's my business, I maintain these things so it's good to have an early warning system. Okay, I said well, how long does it need to last and he said well I'm thinking that, well put a, the little matchbox there, it should last for five years. Okay. Last for five years, it's possible. How often does it need to measure and send a message then to the internet? Oh, well, the guy said, I was thinking of once every five seconds. I said, well, I'm afraid that if you want to send once every five seconds and the thing should last for five years, you can't use the room anymore because it's full of batteries. 
So, so it, it, the, the guy had ridiculous ideas, and the ridiculous ideas were given to him by everybody that, that, that says that, that in IoT we, we can do magic. Yes, we can do magic, but we, we can't do the kind of magic that some of the people expect. So always adjust the expectation of, uh, of, the, of the client to something that is realistic and feasible. Um, it's, like I said, it's how smart your device deals with the amount of energy, determines the size of the battery, determines the size of the, uh, the total thing. Now, another thing is you have to watch out for the, what I call the Swiss Army Knife Syndrome. I thought I made up a new term. I thought, oh, that's a good idea, Swiss Army Knife Syndrome. And then I googled it and then somebody else already made it up. It had more or less the same meaning that I wanted to give it to it. Because what we see that people come in for a simple IoT device, and then they say it needs to do this. But by the way, if we're working on it, it should do this as well. And then it does this, and it does that. So they want to pack every possible sensor they have in mind in that one device. So they really want to create a Swiss army knife of IoT. But what I always say is a Swiss army knife is a knife that is not good at any of the functions that it has in it. It's maybe a bold statement and uh, yeah, I'm afraid I'm invited here by the Swiss, so maybe they are heavily <laughs> offended. But I've never seen a chef in a restaurant cutting the meat with a Swiss army knife. So there must be better knives than the knife blade in a Swiss Army knife. And, and that's the same with, with, with all of this. So I've seen people that made IoT devices. There was a startup in Amsterdam that made the, the air quality egg. So they made a cheap IoT device that everybody would be willing to, pay, to, uh, to, pay, to buy. But it was fitted with a whole range of very poorly made sensors. So you make a device that can do a lot, but cannot do it very good. And that's not good. It's not good for, for business. That's not good for the reputation of IoT. Rather, limit yourself to an IoT device that does one thing very, very well than try to make something that does a lot of things not in, in, in a very good way. So, rather use one good or a few good sensors instead of a, 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 a lot of lousy ones. And the other thing is, try to combine the data that you are collecting with data that is already available. There is an, an enormous amount of data already available through governments, through other organizations. And if you combine available data with the data that you're measuring, you can come up to very smart solutions. For instance, this is one thing that, uh, that came, came up in our organization just recently. We, for many years, we've been using our wind sensing devices, our wind sensors, in cell phone towers. There was a demand that was given to us by the operators. They say, we need to measure the wind speed in our cell phone tower. And yeah, we, we tend to listen to our clients, uh, but, but sometimes you have to stop the nonsense. I said to the guys, if we put wind sensors in your cell phone towers, what are we measuring? And he says, the wind speed. Yeah, but wind speed is something that is already available. Wind speed. There's data on windy.com or windguru. There's lots of places where I can find wind speed information. The wind speed information on the cell phone tower still doesn't tell us if the, uh, the cell phone tower is going to collapse. It, it's pretty useful that when you have a collapsed cell phone tower, that you can say, well, it, it collapsed because the wind was 98 knots. But that's, that's a bit late in, in my honest opinion. So what we say is you better start measuring something that is relevant. Eh? For instance, if you start measuring the amount of motion, I don't know if any of you ever climbed a, a 60 meter tall cell phone tower. No? I did, it's quite a scary uh, thing to do because if you're standing on top of the tower and there's a little bit of wind, the whole thing is moving like this. So you really feel that it's gonna collapse. But that motion is essential because if you would build it rigid, then it would collapse. So, it, so it's, it's built to flex. But it should flex in a known amount. So if you put a motion sensor on top of your cell phone tower and you relate the motion that you are encountering with the wind speed that you're having, you follow that over time. And then if in three months' time the thing moves 20 centimeters more at the same wind as three months before, there could be a structural problem with the device. This is how we say that you should combine data smartly from your IoT device with already available data. I think this is my last slide, but you never know. Uh, yeah, combined with available data. 
So that was my story. Thank you for, uh, for your attention. So now it's time for questions. So what do you guys want to, want to learn about what I've said? Whether what, what I need to add information? What, what specific things do you have in mind? Just shoot. They're, they're shy here. Eh? Like yesterday evening I did the same presentation at Fit Mobile and I had 97 questions. So uh, don't be shy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, no, it's already somebody there. Hello. Is there someone? Um, okay. I just wanted to ask about security regarding the information that you're sending from your IoT devices. Can they be hacked? What can you do about that? What do you use for SODAC in SODAC for security? Now, this is a very good question. Because narrowband IoT is based on the 4G technology, it uses the security of 4G so that the current narrowband IoT devices only operate with an, uh, an active SIM card. And all the security protocols that have been implementing in, in your normal voice communication are adapted to narrowband IoT. So, so we, we have a world population of a few billion people that are using phones, and they all trust the security of the mobile operators. So I think they will trust the security of, uh, of uh, narrowband IoT in the same manner as that they trust the, uh, the, the communication on, uh, on your narrowband IoT device. Yeah? yeah, does that answer your question? or? Thank you. Uh, all of those devices seems that are vulnerable to get stolen. How do you address that issue? Well, you can't really address the issue of a device getting stolen. It, it's a very valid point. Uh, when we started implementing this on these bridges, I thought, well, if the boom is closed, the thing is in front of the bicycles that are parked there. So there must be some sort of a smart kid that thinks, I want one, so they bring a screwdriver and they take it off. So yes, you stand the chance that people are stealing your device. Uh, there's not much you can do about it. We, we once made, uh, made, made an enclosure, made of re really thick steel uh, with, with a padlock so that they couldn't uh, remove the box. And that, that, uh, that can stop people from, from tampering with your device. But st stopping people altogether from stealing it is, is, uh, is a very difficult one. I've seen, however, one company that makes a little tracking IoT tracking device that has a smart uh, attaching mechanism. Uh, it's double-sided tape that you tape it to stick it to, uh, to some sort of uh, object. But there is a sensor in the tape that if somebody pulls it off, the sensor gets activated and it starts sending alert messages. So at least you will know that your device uh, has been tampered with or has been stolen. Uh, whether you would then still will find it back depends on how long it keeps in operation. If it's a tracking device, then maybe, yeah, you can follow the GPS position to the, the home of the person that has stolen it. Yep. No, this is already coming. Um, I can see in, in liter literature, in film, in movies, that everybody somehow is aware of this thing connecting with machines, right? It's all um, cyberpunk, you know, everybody has this in their mind now that at some point we're going to connect with machines and be part, half part machine. Uh, how far are we away from this future? Is this a future that actually awaits us? I mean, where is the limit of interconnectivity with technology? Is there like a healthy limit or what, what's your vision on that? Is it well, the, the, there's, there's a couple of things there. Of course, the, the technology is ready to connect anything and everything. Um, is, that, is that a scary thing? Because, because uh, you, you're talking about science fiction movies whereby we're really afraid of uh, uh, that, that the, the, the big brother is watching you, that, that, yeah, that, that, that people know of all your moves and all your actions. Well, I have to disappoint you, they already know. Uh, with your smartphone, all your moves of you, wherever you go, are registered by your smartphone. Now, I saw a documentary recently whereby uh, people did some experiments on the smartphone and people thought, well, I put my phone in airplane mode, but the phone continues registration all your moves. And as soon as you switch it off airplane mode, it still sends everything up, up to the cloud. So um, 
we as humans, we, we have said goodbye to our privacy. We, we, can, we can make privacy laws and everything, but we're never going to stop the Googles of, the, of this world to still know everything about us. So I don't think IoT devices will make things worse than what they already are. Um, so so, so the, the, my advice would be if, if you, you want to stick to, to absolute privacy, uh, move to an uninhabited island with no cell phone connectivity and any, anything. That's the only place where you would still have privacy. Uh, I have a question. Uh, you showed us very good examples of sensing uh, examples of sensing technology. What about actuating technologies? Do you have some good examples? Well, the, one of the examples actually of actuating was the, the street lights. Huh? The adaptive street lights is you send the message to the light and the light goes uh, dimmer or brighter. But, but there's, there's also, let's say, uh, uh, shutters and valves and, uh, and things that you could open and, and close that can all be done with, with IoT. Um, somebody once asked me, uh, do you see IoT as a mechanism for operating uh, traffic lights, for instance? But that doesn't make sense because the traffic light, it, that's a local situation. You, uh, you have one crossing, you, you may communicate with the next crossing, but you don't need a cloud-operated uh, system for you to, uh, to operate your traffic lights. So, so with, with, with actuation, you really, uh, actuators, you really have to think, uh, what are the things that you would really like to control from the cloud? Um, Often, it's the case that uh, your IoT device may be sensing the temperature and has the internal intelligence to act internally on the temperature change. So, so it does the sensing actuating locally without control of the cloud and reports it back to the, uh, the cloud system. That is a more common scenario for IoT devices. You can set the parameters. Yeah, the yeah. yeah that maybe it's a good example uh, just for entertainment is um, in the United States there was a company that made a, uh, a sort of a pet feeding robot thing. So if you would go away for, for two weeks, three weeks on holiday, and you, you have these little uh, doors that your cat can walk into the house, you could have a cat feeding robot that gives your cat just the measured amount of food every day. So they sold it, and I, I think that they, they had a big sales, that they sold tens of thousands of these units. And then at one stage, their server crashed. And it, um, it took them a week before the server came back up. So, they violated rule number one. And rule number one for actuators is actually relying on the network for the actuation. If you would ask me to design a pet feeding robot, I would ask the user on his smartphone to type in the schedule, and then I would send the schedule over the cloud to the device. And when you send a new schedule, you send a new schedule to the device. But for the operation, for feeding the cat, the device doesn't need the internet, doesn't need the services, it's all processed locally. So that's a very good example of how you can do things in the right way or in the wrong way. Yep. So, uh, we talked yesterday that a year ago, some kind of, it's not a challenge, but uh, public uh, 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 offering of narrowband IoT happened in Holland and you actually created their uh, suit for testing and a lot of people joined this community and started developing narrowband IoT solutions. So after a year, what is the result? Are you satisfied with that? Was it successful? What you can co recommend to us to make this successful? Yeah, so the, the, the prime reason for the success was that what T-Mobile did in Holland is overnight they switched on and they made the whole country active. The whole country had overnight narrowband IoT connectivity. And that was the reason of the great success of this experiment, because people could buy a starter kit and they could st start developing by using it at any location they wanted to use it. So in Holland these developments went really, really quickly. What T-Mobile, or Deutsche Telekom, the, the parent company, did in Germany, they said, we, uh, we opened a couple of development centers and that's where we enable the technology. So they had one of these, uh, what they call the development hubs in uh, Berlin, and they had one in Dusseldorf. So the developers had to go to a specific place to fiddle around and try it out. That was never a success because then people had to travel a long distance. You make a little modification to your software, get in the car, and drive for three quarters of an hour to test it. So th that's the wrong way of doing it. The right way of doing it is, is right from the start, offer the services to everyone. Maybe not today, and I understand that for this challenge, for instance, you're going to offer uh, it, it, it here.
but that's for the community that is here. So that's not such a big deal. But once you go live to a larger audience, make sure that you have countrywide coverage. Yes, done? Well, thank you very much all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, nastavljamo dalje sa programom. Um, takmičenje VIP IoT Challenge digitalizuje društvo ne bi bilo moguće bez naših partnera. Uh, zato bih zamolio uh, naše partnere da nas se ukratko obrate. Uh, profesor uh, Aleksandar Nešković sa elektrotehničkog fakulteta. Izvolite. Pa, ja bih želeo pre svega da vas pozdravim u ime elektrotehničkog fakulteta. Fakultet je, kao što znate, uvek podržavao tehnološki razvoj u ovoj zemlji sa svih mogućih aspekata. Ovo je jedna od lepih prilika gde Srbija nije samo u korak sa svetom, nego je jedna od onih zemalja gde se prvi put ispituje nova tehnologija, naročito Nero Band IoT. I mi smo osjećali potrebu da se pridružimo u ovoj akciji. Naši mentori, profesori s našeg fakulteta će davati podršku timovima koji se priključe u ovoj lepoj akciji. Nadamo se da ćemo doći do lepih i korisnih rješenja. Ono što bih ja želeo možda kao profesor, uvek profesor imaju nekakve savete da dam, to je da danas na internetu možete naći puno već nekakvih rješenja koji se tiču ove oblasti, ali u stvari možda je najbolje krenuti od sebe samih i pogledati i razmisliti šta vas najviše nervira i šta biste hteli da promenite u vašem neposrednom okruženju i tada ćete doći možda i do najlepših i najinovativnijih rješenja. Jer ovaj primjer koji je kolega divno dao sa ovom mišolovkom, gledajte, neko je imao problem što je uhvatio pacova, a posle toga ga nije sklonio. Puno takvih primjera mi imamo danas u okruženju. Ovo je jedno polje koje tek počinje sa implementacijom. Za sad smo u nekoj fazi igre i to je najlepše da se igramo kao odrasli sa nekim modernim Lego kockicama. Ali i za ove priče koje je na neki način tek započeta, stoji i jedna mnogo šira konotacija, a to je da u nekom našem budućem razvoju, nekim našim budućim životima, mi nećemo moći da živimo bez ovoga. Jer bilo koji proces, bilo koju proizvodnju da imamo, ako nije potpuno optimalna, mi nećemo biti potpuno, nećemo biti uopšte ravnopravni sa drugim zemljama koji će ulaziti u ovu priču i tu više nema nikakve dileme. Ono što je ovde možda još zgodno da se naglasi, Neuroband IoT je jedna od tehnologija koja se pojavljuje u ovom segmentu, međutim, treba imati u vidu da je to tehnologija koja ide kroz javne mobilne sisteme, što je jedna značajna prednost iz prostog razloga što javni mobilni sistemi imaju razrađene mehanizme za razvoj, za održavanje, za podršku I u tom segmentu, to nas je istorija naučila, neće biti uopšte dileme da li će to da ide u nekom budućem razvoju. Puno ima tehnologije koje se rode, budu sjajne, superiorne, ali zbog nedostatka podrške, ako hoćete čak i marketinga gde se inženjeri uvek naježe, oni ne uspeju da prežive. Ovo je tehnologija koja ide kroz javne mobilne sisteme i ja bar tu nemam nikakvu dilemu da će to da bude jedna priča koja će dugi niz godina trajati. Ne bih dalje dužio. Inženjeri ne voli puno da pričaju, ne da slušaju. Ja bih vam samo poželeo kako ko. Ja bih vam poželeo puno uspeha i ja čekam sa pažnjom i sa nestrpljenjem da vidim kakve ideje će da se izrode iz ovog našeg konteksta. Hvala. Hvala, profesoro. I would like to invite Mr. Tony Krizoli from Friedrich Naumann Foundation. Thank you, George. Listen, guys, I think nobody left the room when Jan was speaking in English, and I questioned myself just, you know, what is worse, listen to a German guy speaking Serbian or speaking English? So I decided to do it in English just to honor our guest, because what he said was very valuable and very interesting, and I just feel bad doing it in Serbian here, right? Uh, so I come from another organization, which is the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for Freedom. We deal with education, adult education, in 70 countries all over the world. And digital transformation is one of the core topics we deal with as an international organization. We are very different than the other 
partners here because we are not really dealing with IoT. We are not developing any kind of sensors. What we do is we help the process of getting these things into our lives by educating the people that very often decide upon if these things are allowed to be part of our lives. Very often these people are decision makers, politicians, and what, what we do is we bring educational programs to them and all the other key stakeholders in the process of bringing a digital uh, society into a reality. And what we do is basically we also, next to education, bring networking to the table, right? So we allow all these stakeholders to, do, to communicate, let's say, with you guys who are the developers who create these ideas. But we also help them to leave their little bubble. Very often what we see is, you know, a mayor having a wonderful idea, building an IoT solution, building a smart city thing, and then he doing it, or she is doing it by, by herself or himself, creating their own protocols, you know, so own solution, and then they are not working with any of the other solutions out there. This is a very bad thing. Another thing also we're doing is matchmaking. We, we try to bring the right people together to do the next step. If you have a good idea, you might need help uh, with the next step, uh, getting this project running or getting it financed or, you know, getting it approved. We try to help the process by getting the pe right people together to actually make a, a project a reality, right? So another thing, and why we're here in this thing, we want to help the challenge, which I think is an incredible project, by supporting the education, the mentorship program. This is what we at the Naumann Foundation like to do, to provide education for you guys, right? So this is what we want to do. And we do this since 2013, honestly, and we were one of the first partners joining the challenge then. And what I can see now today is that the challenge has become from a, you know, a little bit of an underdog program, now being actually one of the major programs here in the region. This is a great success, and this kind of success you can see everywhere. We work in the field since 2013, not only in Serbia, but also in the broader region and Eastern Europe. And there are many things, many great stories, many successes we, we see. And there's also another thing we try to do. We want to spread the message, right? And one of the ways how we spread all the good successes and all the best practices and all uh, the thing they are, the potential we have in the region is why another project where most of or many of you organizations are participating in, this is Smart City Festival, also the ICT Hub and also in the Challenge, all of them are part of, a, of this project. And this will happen in, uh, from 19th to 21st of October. And at this uh, big event, which will be held in Dom Omlande, we are actually going to showcase what uh, what our region has to offer when it comes to digital transformation, when it comes to solution business ideas. Uh, this is actually one of the, we are really looking forward to this because of this, the challenge and all the partners hopefully will be there and show what they have achieved until this point of time. So I'm really happy to be part of this project once again. It can only be get better from here and also with VIP uh, introducing now narrowband technology. I mean, this will be really a big step uh, into the future, I can hardly wait to, to, to have my own IoT devices somewhere in my home. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Tony. Veoma nam je drago što imamo i ime jednog velike globalne firme uz nas challenge. Zato bih pozvao Dušana Tomića iz Nokije da nas pozdravi. Nokia ne proizvodi samo mobilne telefone, što je prva asocijacija. Hvala. Ne brinite još samo par rečenica, nisam profesor pa nisam naviku na mikrofon i na govore. Svarno nam je čast da učestvujemo u ovom projektu, u ovom challenge-u i da podržimo VIP i sve lokalne partnere u ovom challenge-u. Razmišljali smo kako to da najbolji način da pomognemo i uključit ćemo ideja, pošto imamo dosta globalnih kolega koji rade na globalnim projektima, da oni se uključi kao preko mentorstva, da pomognu, da pomognemo zajedno razvijenimo što više ideja i da razvijemo te neke nove tehnologije ovde i naravno poveli bi kolege iz tih timova u Finsku da zajedno obićemo to da vidite kako to izgleda. Hvala, hvala Dušana. 
I sada jedna od naših najjačih firmi koja se bavi razvojem IoT rešenja, ne samo IoT-a, već generalno klikova i jedna od zaista najprepoznatljivih organizacija u makerskom svetu i u Srbiji i šire. I veoma nam je bilo drago kada je Jan došao da je vas prve spomenuo, mikroelektronika. Hvala vam na podršci. Aleksandre. Prvo hvala na uvodu, odlično. Ja sam Aleksandar, dolazim iz mikroelektronike. Ja sam produkt menadžer za pomenute klikove. Mi direktno radimo IoT, kad kažem direktno, bavimo se alatima za razvoj stvari koje ćete vi praviti od mikrokontrolera, od softvera, od hardvera, uključujući i klik pločice koje vam dozvoljavaju pristup periferijama. Kada su nas pozvali ljudi iz VIP Mobile, naravno da smo pristali, Konkretno od Janora su započeli par projekata sa kompanijama Ublox i Quactel, ne znam da li smemo da reklamiramo, koje će biti puštene sljedećeg meseca i koje će se koristiti u ovom takmičenju. Tako da, da ne napomenem, testiranje takvih uređaja kod nas je bilo malo challenging, tako da smo morali malo inostranstvo, ali sve u svemu VIP je mogućio mrežu i to stvarno svaka vam čast, prva kompanija koja je izašla sa IoT, NB IoT podrškom, to će omogućiti i nama testiranje. Ono što želim samo da stvarno da kažem, da vam želim puno sreće, na ovom takmičenju mislim da će biti sjajno iskustvo i za mikroelektroniku i za vas i to je to od mene. Hvala. Hvala puno. Samo da napomenem, na samom takmičenju takmičari će imati mogućnost da biraju između razvojnih pločica mikroelektronike i sodaka. Zahvalio bih se također našim medijskim partnerima Netokraciji i Blicu, koji će redovno izveštavati o takmičenju i podići vidljivo svih timova i svih njihovih projekata u javnosti. E sada, šta je... VIP IoT Challenge, nešto što spominjemo već celo veče, dakle takmičenje za timove u kreiranju najboljih sveobuhvatnih IoT rešenja sa jasnom upotrebnom vrednošću koristeći tehnologiju Neuroband IoT o kojoj smo večeras pričali. Ideja je bila da spojimo, da prikupimo najbolje timove i da im pružimo obuku, opremu, pristup laboratorijama, mentorsku podršku, novčane nagrade, putovanje, kao što je Dušan spomenuo, i mogućnost testiranja njihovih rešenja uz jedinstvenu priliku testiranja eksperimentalnog Nervo Band IoT signala. Odabrat ćemo deset timova koji će imati tri meseca za razvoj svojih rešenja uz obuke, treninge i mentorsku podršku i pristup čak dvema laboratorijama za razvoj i testiranje, jedna ovde kod nas u ICT Hubu gde će isto biti omogućen narrowband IoT signal u celom prostoru, druga u laboratoriji VIP Mobile-a. Omogućit ćemo prvi Living Lab u Srbiji. Šta je Living Lab? Na jednom ili više mesta, to ćemo utvrditi do kraja godine, će biti pušten na baznim stanicama, biti pušten signal narrowband IoT-a kako bi uređaj koji se razvijaju na takmičnju, mogli da se testiraju u realnim uslovima na polju, tamo gde van laboratorije, kako bi smo zaista videli njihovu vrednost. Oprema, koju smo isto spomenuli, kao što smo rekli, imat ćemo mikroelektronikine i sodakove pločice. Ukupna vrednost opreme je otprilike 500 evra po timu. Dakle, svaki tim koji bude odabran će dobiti, moći će obira između sodakove razvojne pločice ili mikroelektronikine sa po tri senzora i imat će dodatni budžet od 200 evra da sami izaberu dodatne komponente senzore koje im trebaju za njihova rešenja. Teme na koju ćemo se fokusirati su transport i saobraćaj, poljoprivreda, zaštita životne sredine i nosivi uređaji. Ono što je jako bitno istaći jeste da su ove teme više kao usmerenja koje želimo, međutim nećemo se ograničiti ukoliko primimo zaista kvalitetnu ideju za nešto što je izvan ove teme, naravno da ćemo taj tim pozvati na razgovor. 
kriterijumi za odabir timova jeste prethodno iskustvo tima i u softverskom i u hardverskom developmentu i u razvoju digitalnih rešenja, poželjno je prethodno iskustvo u preduzetništvu, razumevanje problema koji se rešava, inovativnost predloženog rešenja, koherentnost tima, odnosno da je tim svestran da može da sprovede ovo rešenje koje predlaže i upotrebna vrednost. I to je ono na čemu insistiramo, jeste da rešenja koja tražimo ne moraju imati neku monetarnu vrednost, ne moraju imati uopšte komponentu monetizacije. Dakle, ukoliko napravite rešenje koje će samo imati korisnike i pružiti neke relevantne podatke, vršiti neku ulogu, međutim neće ostvarivati zaradu, to je isto dobrodošlo na takmičenju. Naravno, izvodljivost je isto jako bitna i to ćemo uporediti sa prethodnim iskustvom tima. Što se tiče timeline na samog takmičenja, prijave se otvaraju danas, odnosno večeras, nakon događaja i traju do 30. septembra. 1. i 2. oktobera ćemo organizovati intervjue sa odabranim timovima kako bi se bolje upoznali i razgovarali o njihovim idejama, a obavezan bootcamp za sve primljene timove će se održati 4. i 5. oktobera ovde u ICT Hubu. Tokom oktobra i decembra kreće edukativni program i sama akceleracija, rad sa mentorima i razvijanje rešenja u laboratorijama i krajem januara očekujemo organizaciju velikog finalnog događaja gde ćemo proglasiti tri najbolja rešenja. Ono što ste svi verovatno čekali, nagradni fond u ukupnom vrednosti od 10.000 evra koje obezbeđuju VIP Mobile i Nokia i ICT Hub, bit će raspoređen među tri prva mesta, dakle 5.000, 3.000 koje obezbeđuje VIP Mobile i 2.000 evra za treće plasirani tim koje obezbeđuje ICT Hub uz put u jednu od laboratorija Nokia u Finsku, gde će timovi moći da se malo više upoznaju sa tehnologijom Neuroband IoT i da razmene iskustva sa kolegama iz Nokia. Važne napomene koje treba imati na umu jeste da timovi mogu imati najviše četiri člana. Članovi tima moraju biti državljani Republike Srbije. Zamjena članova tima u nekom trenutku kada krene takvenčanje je moguće uz odobrenje organizatora. IoT rešenja moraju da komuniciraju pomoću VIP, Neuroband, IoT mreže. Rešenje u celini moraju da budu originalna duhovna tvorovina članova tima, dakle ne smete prijedljivati rešenja na koje nemate autorska prava. Oprema i sam prototip koji se razvije tokom takmičenja ostaje u vlastništvu VIP-a, međutim intelektualna svojina i ideja ostaje timu koji je koji se takmičio. Dakle, sam prototip ostaje u vlasništvu VIP mobila. To je to. Čekamo vašu prijevu do 30. septembra. Možete posjetiti sajt digitalizujdruštvo.rs gde se nalazi prijemni formular. I ukoliko imate bilo kojih pitanja, sada je trenutak. Tu su i kolegi iz VIP mobila, iz tehnike, tu su nam svi partneri. Ukoliko imate bilo kakve pitanja vezano za takmičenje, možete sada da nas pitate. I naravno, posle ovoga je planirano druženje, imamo točilicu sa pivom i čips, pa možete malo u neformalnoj atmosferi ako ste stiljivi. Evo, Nikola. Na sajtu piše da je maksimalno pet članova. To je greška. Ja se izvinjavam u napred. Četiri člana tima. Još neko pitanje? Koliko ne, hvala vam puno, prijavite se za takmičenje na sajtu Digitalizu i društvo RS i pridružite nam se na pivu i čipsu. Hvala vam.